Pelling. He is a member of the International Seminar on Urban Form since 1999. He focuses his research on the interpretation of the urban form as a basis for urban design, urban morphology, sustainability, and urban design can be considered the keywords of his work. And on these topics, he published numerous studies and articles on Italian and international reviews as a number of books, international review. And Marco Merotto is founder and director of RAM Research in Culture and Urban Morphology. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for your uh, uh, very kind invitation. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Yes. Okay, I, I think and I hope you can see it, yes. All right, so uh, the, the, the title, let's say, of my lecture is Environmental Urban Design, the Role of Urban Morphology. Uh, during this lecture, you're going to, are we going to, to show you very briefly my, our methodology in environmental urban design? And first of all, we are going to explain why urban morphology. Uh, everywhere we talk about sustainability, environment, microclimate, and so on. But uh, we believe that nowadays architectural culture and uh, above all architecture and urban designers have to be very aware on how architecture and design can really be uh, sustainable, can really be uh, environment friendly. Uh, it is not a matter of engineering, it is not a matter of technicians, it is a matter of architecture, then it is a matter of something that belongs to all of us. Uh, so we have to, uh, to start thinking that all the environmental topics, issues, tools have to be considered as part of the same, let's say, toolkit of an architect for the 21st century. Why urban design and why urban morphology? Urban design because of all, of all the uh, hyper complexity of the contemporary city uh, nowadays ask for a very wide, let's say, holistic approach to, uh, to the city design and to the architecture. We are not anymore in the modern time, we are not anymore in the postmodern era. We are in something that is growing, something completely new. We are facing with uh, completely smart living, we are facing with what had to be as much as possible a sustainable way of living, a way of using resources, way of use our cities. So for this reason, even when we designed the architectural scale, we had to be aware of what is happening around us. You have, we have to be aware on how our architecture is going to uh, influence and um, inform the overall urban form and the, uh, the life of a city. Also because if we don't do this, the, uh, the city that is a complex system made of, first of all, man, so first of all, made of its citizen, will cut off our architecture. So one very new thing for the future is that, first of all, architects have to be very aware of the city, of the urban context in which they are going to design. Uh, basically, to let their architecture to be aware and to be, uh, let's say, awake and to alive across the next years. In this sense, urban morphology is very important because urban morphology is the, let's say, the, the discipline able to put together design and analysis. We are working this topic very much and what we are going to show you today is how urban morphology and urban analysis can be the two base of a contemporary environmental urban design not just urban design. I think that the, the, the urban design of the future has to be environmental urban design. So we, we sh I will show you this, uh, my, the, our methodology very briefly. Uh, I will show you some, uh, basically some projects and above all two main ones that we've been dealing with during the last uh, few, actually few, two and three years actually. So, the RAM methodology, RAM is the Zaba Research Group, as Odzga uh, said before, you know, on the, uh, it is for researchers in architecture and urban morphology. It, it is based on, let's say, uh, six steps. The first one is the flows analysis of the urban context. That is very important because analyzing the flows of pedestrian living, working, and walking on the, along the streets and the squares of any kind of city, 
we can design a new kind of, um, of morphological map. We used to, uh, you will see it, used to, we used to draw a classic morphological map until few, very few years ago. But we then discovered that the, 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 the mapping of flows, uh, of pedestrian flows inside the urban fabric, it was the solution for having a new kind of morphological map, a dynamic morphological map. So without losing all the information elements, and we will see in, 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 a, in, a, in a minute, all the information that the traditional morphological map used to bring together, flows analysis help us to understand how urban morphology is alive today, how it would be alive probably tomorrow, and how it could be, it could behave in three months, three weeks, sorry, three months, two years, three years, and whatever. So the first step of this methodology is the analysis of pedestrian flows in order to have this dynamic, uh, active, let's say, vibrant morphological map. The second step is, of course, to create a, a, a list of uh, uh, data map. So it is the, the phase of data analysis. Uh, uh, first of all, the functional map, because if we have to, to face with a, uh, an urban project, we need to know the functions of, the, of a, a specific context, but we don't no, we don't, we're not going to design according to this context, according to these functions, sorry. We will use it later on because functions change over time. We cannot design a, a neighborhood, for instance, thinking to the, fun, to the functions of today, because if tomorrow this function will change, our master plan will fail. So together with morphological, dynamic morphological map on a, morph, on a flow basis, we create a number of, uh, of um, data map the functional, the functional one is the most important, of course, in order to give information, to inform, let's say, the morphological map on the different kind of data this specific context we are going to design are made of. The third step is the environmental analysis one. So we make, first of all, a general environmental analysis on the context in order to understand the main uh, features, the main uh, criticalities, the main elements that characterized from a microclimate point of view, the context in we, that we are analyzing in this, in this moment and that we are going to design in the future. The fourth step is then finally the morphological master plan. On the base of the morphological, the dynamic morphological map, on the base of the all the different data or let's say specific maps, and the, the first stage of the environmental analysis, we draw our morphological master plan. On this base, then we reach the, we reach the five step, that is the environmental analysis two. So it's to verify the, what we have been design, analyzing and designing uh, in the morphological master plan from a, an environmental point of view. That is very important because it represents the sort of a, um, bridge because, um, between the all the analytic phase and the synthetic, so the design phase. Environmental analysis, for instance, uh, uh, tell us if the volumes are right, if the open spaces are um, had to be better designed or had some crit uh, critical issues and whatever. They are very, very important. In order to have, at the end of the day, an urban master plan in which the form of the new neighborhood, even the form of the architecture, follow one side the morphological analysis and so the way it dialogue with the form, with the urban fabric of the city in which we are designing. This dialogue is based on the present, we look at the future, but it is also have to be very aware of the past because the rules for which a city have been drawn, have been building over time, more or less on, on a morphological base are always the same. Then on the other side, this urban market plan has, has, to be, so has to consider all the uh, uh, environmental elements, all the environmental critics, issues, or uh, let's say criticalities, we have to, we've been facing during the analytic, um, the analytic moment. So all these elements together are more dynamic urban morphology based on flows and environmental analysis, at the end of the day, come into one uh, general urban master plan. But it, it is a, uh, let's say, multi-scalar uh, master plan because it works at the urban scale, but is since the beginning very aware of the neighborhoods and even at the architectural scale. But we will see later on. First of all, let's start thinking about the flows. Flows is something quite new, it's something very important. Okay. Uh, we have been 
starting analyzing flows uh, using uh, just counting people moving around in the uh, public spaces of cities. Then we reached the higher technological level using apps with the with smartphones. Then we start thinking of working with uh, um, um, telephone telephone cells and above all, uh, or sorry, sniffer Wi-Fi and above all, of course, the GPR, G GPS. Generally speaking, this is the framework on all flows analysis for urban morphology. First of all, is to, in, to underline the flow values. So we uh, we discovered three elements: the quantity of units, you know, of people that cross a given uh, urban area, the speed of these people, and the direction of these people. Then I will explain you how it works. Then we organize the uh, the classes of this quantity, speed, and directions because we had to uh, uh, count them, but we also had to create flows. So we had to understand what is the high flows, what is the medium flows, what is the low flows of people, and so on, in order to compare it inside these public spaces where the public spaces we're analyzing, analyzing, but even to compare this with other public spaces of the, around the city, and if we want, even two different cities. Then we have the value maps. Sorry, the, uh, the, flow, class, uh, the, the flow classes are, of course, uh, directly related to the quantity, the speed, and the direction of, this, uh, of these units. That means that on the base of the quantity, we have the different kind of nodality levels of the open spaces. On the base of the speed, we have the different levels of, of urbanity of this of uh, different uh, um, open spaces. And uh, on the base of the direction of this uh, units, of course, we had the different levels of relationship. Or, or, um, that means how any single public spaces within the city dialogue with the other kind of uh, with the other public spaces within the city. Finally, we have the value maps, a value of nodality, a value of an urban of urbanity, let's say, and a value of relationship. But how that how do they work? I mean, of course, the, the, the topic is very complex, but just to let you understand how this topic can be very useful for the urban analysis. We have these flow values, quantity, speed, and direction, and it is very easy we can organize the quantity of people going up and down in classes. And we can hey, say class A, class B, class C, but even subclasses. So A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on, and, and so on. They're very important because in this way, we can start designing our morphological map, but it is a dynamic morphological map. We don't have just the matrix row because it is the main one, but it could be the main, it is, is it the main one today or not? On this base, we know that that is absolutely the main one. The speed is very important. Actually, we first calculate the speed of, uh, of these classes because, of course, we are interested in pedestrian flows because pedestrian flows are the one directly connected with the um, urbanity value of an urban fabric. Then on the speed, we have a class of pedestrians, a class of bikes and similars. We, we have a class C of made of cars, more motorbikes, and whatever. That they, and these elements are these data are less interesting because, uh, first of all, the quality of an urban living above all for this smart city that is based on smart device that is based on very close uh, range of movement, uh, everyday range of movement, much more than before. The pedestrian way of, of using the city by people is very important, and above all, thinking about sustainability is very important. And then the, the direction. If you're analyzing flows, we have to know how many people, so how how many of those quantity come from uh, point A to point B, from point C to point D, and whatever. So quantity, the speed, uh, tell us the quality of uh, of units moving. The quantity and the direction tell us basically how these flows are made of. What we can uh, realize is that um, uh, as much as the quantity is higher, as much as the nodality value of the place we are analyzing is higher. More people, highest nodality. Less people, let's say, lowest nodality. The way the direct of this quantity is direct to connect with directions, of course, tell us if these flows go up to a particular place in the city or down. All these elements are very important because we can read them 
in, in trends. So we can read it weekly, monthly, uh, every year, every two years. They tell us how people basically use the public space of the city and then how people basically use uh, the city. On this space, very, very uh, roughly explained, I know, but we, we, uh, we don't have time to do it, to do, to do more. On this base, we start working in our design. Oop, what's happening? Yes. Let's go to see some case study. Uh, here we are in Rome. Um, oh, something I, I didn't say uh, about the, our methodology is this one, that we use as a uh, technique tools the of course the geographical information system in order to put all the information together in a very valuable way and the uh, software envimet uh, uh, the beginning was ecotech now is envimet uh, in order to make the environmental analysis but let's go to some case study this is a very important area in rome is the tridente di campo marzio on a very basic morphological analysis, we know how it is. Uh, it had been designed by um, during the 16th century, but of course, the building up of this area happened through centuries. It is still there, <laughs> so we still have also the 20, 21st uh, uh, step, 21st levels of this uh, transformation and evolution on this neighborhood. At the beginning, we have the other Babuino as a matrix, so main road. From via the Babuino, some roads start, um, we call them uh, building path. So there are the roads on which the urban fabric have been, have been built up across century. Then we have via del Corso, that it is the main road. So we call it matrix route for all this section of the Tridente di Campo Mar, so the neighborhoods, with all this road along which the different urban fabric has been, uh, have been built up. And via del Babuino, it is on building path. This is the history. This is how the Tridente di Campo Marzio more or less have been settled and developed over centuries. Here is a, a, an overview from the, from, the, from the top. If you have a look at this block, you clearly see, if you look at the red walls, how all these walls are perfectly aligned with each other, remembering us that the overall design have been really designed on a, on a piece of paper with a, with a, a pencil in a hand by uh, Antonio da San Gallo and many other architects of the 16th century. But the way the area has been built up is completely spontaneous and it, it is based on a typological process that maybe you know of the um, Roman context. We are not going to analyze the typological process, but anyway, this is the way the normal, the traditional urban morphology have been working till few years ago. But if we have a look of the di Campo Marcio today from a um, flows point of view, we immediately see that the original three axes, one, two, and three, so Via del um, via di Ripetta, Via del Corso, Via del Babuino, together with Via Condotti, have changed their value. Uh, nowadays, the most important access is Via del Corso, so the central one, and Via Condotti. After Via del Corso and Via Condotti, we have Via uh, della Croce. The rest, for instance, the road that is in the middle, that is Via Borgognona, are completely, let's say, um, let's say anti-nodal. So if Via del Corso and Via Condotti are hugely, uh, has got very high nodality value, and Via della Croce, it is good at nodality value, but a little, a, little, a little bit less. Via Borgognona or even via, via, this, via Frattina has got a very, very low value. Here is a, a view from, uh, from, from above once again. Here is Via del Corso. Here is Via del, uh, del Babuino. This is Via, del, uh, via Condotti and Via della Croce. This is the most important one Oops, today. This is secondary important, but it is important. This in the middle, and we are talking about 15, 50 meters from here to here, from here to here, are absolutely second, secondary. High, very high nodality value, medium high nodality value, absolutely small nodality, low nodality value. And if you have a picture, even going on uh, Google, uh, Google Earth or a map or whatever, you see this, 
any day of the year you pass through this road, you see Via Condotti with a good number of people. You have uh, Via della Croce with a good number of people as well. And you even see that Via del Condotti is made of people walking and making shop, shopping because Via Condotti, it is the, is the most important road for the high shopping in Rome. Via della Croce is the place for for food, you know, you see many, many restaurants, people sit and eating, drinking and whatever. So we see how the morphological analysis from a dynamic point of view, so made based on flows and the functions of the nowadays city start working together. Specific function for Via Condotti, high modality value, specific function, but different from the first one because it's based on food for Via della Croce, Via Borgognona is almost empty. That is very important for an urban designer to understand and to have this new kind of tools that is the dynamic or uh, urban morphology. Well, let's go to have a look to some um, design examples. Uh, I've been very, very short on the anal analysis and on the, uh, the methodology because uh, the, the analytical part of methodology, because uh, we don't have time. And, uh, as you see, all this, all the things I'm going to show you are. Uh, with the, the product the results of many years of research and design. So I, that's why I, I'll be very, very short, but I'm going to, I want to, start to show you some project because I think it's the best way to understand what we are talking about. Let's start from, from the beginning. At the beginning of our uh, experience in building this methodology, we have a, a design for the Santa Andrea de Bezos waterfront in Barcelona. It was an empty space uh, dominated by this huge central uh, eating uh, cooling plant here in the middle. We start making a traditional morphological map. And on the, the base of traditional morphological map, we create the first morphological master plan. Um, just to be brief, but you know, a master plan that used this ex existing axis as a uh, uh, let's say is a limit between the, the existing urban fabric and a new waterfront. That is why we gave attention, gave attention to the road that go from the sea to the inner side of the city. These, all these penetrating routes are the most important ones for the new design and they are crossed by a sort of a street square pedestrian here in the middle and of course the uh, active waterfront uh, on, to the to east, actually uh, the, the, the north is on the right hand side. Then, this is a data analysis, data sheet. Then we made, we made a morphological, a design morphological map, but we didn't use, we, we were not using uh, flows yet. So we made the original and traditional morphological analysis on the base on typology, even functions and whatever. Then we made a design morphological map. So the morphological map of the, all the neighborhood that we've been designing in order to see if this, the existing one and the new one used to dialogue to them, together. So in a very, according to a very empirical way. Then, but just then we start making an environmental analysis of our urban, new urban fabric. We choose this uh, neighborhood unit. We use very much this dimension, the neighborhood unit, because we believe it is the intermediate level between the urban design and the architectural design. They work perfectly on a morphological level and on environmental level. So that is why we focus always on this very important concept that is the neighborhood unit. Then on the base of the environmental analysis, we made some changements, some arrangement of the original morphological master plan, and we draw the new one with few corrections. Uh, uh, basic in this case, we work very much on materials and, um, and orientations. And this is the result. We made actually two uh, experience uh, because uh, this one, uh, it was a workshop. And so with a different group of designers, we, but using the same tools, we try to, to make the same experience, morphological analysis, morphological mass plan. And it is very interesting because in this case, the, the existing road was transformed in a real boulevard in order to put together the waterfront and the existing city, while all the penetrating routes were treated as a pedestrian, uh, let's say small wooden square. So, so something very, very local. Here in this, uh, let's say, um, uh, variation in this other uh, other design, 
uh, we uh, options, let's say, it is the horizontal road that are most important, actually the boulevard and the, the waterfront. The rest is made of small pedestrian, you know, uh, road and square, small square crossing and a big park in the middle, continuing the existing Bezos Park right here on the left hand side. So it is interesting because uh, at the end of the day, using the same tools in the same place, so doing the same kind of experience, but uh, working with two different designers groups, at the end of the day, we have two completely different uh, projects, but all of them very aware from a morphological point of view, from the quality point of view of life, and even aware from an environmental point of view. Even here, then we made the uh, morphological map, the design morphological map, and the environmental analysis of the different kind of uh, neighborhood units. And this is the, re, uh, the uh, new result. After Barcelona, another example, another case study was the one of Krakow. Uh, in this case, uh, we might say that the, the morphological analysis was much more deeper than the, the, the environmental one, because Krakow has a very uh, uh, layered history, very interesting. We made so this analysis on the two, let's say, of the two Krakows, the, 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 the medieval one, the Greek one in the middle, and the um, uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century one, like uh, right around. Uh, we made a study deep, also thanks to Agatha, the professor Agatha Kantarek on the uh, urban block, and so on. And we designed then a new neighborhoods in the in the fringe belt of Krakow, but trying to keep together all the elements that have been characterizing the urban morphology of the existing uh, city. We go faster, we, have, we made, of course, a, a new morphological map, a design morphological map, in order to see if all the morphological uh, features uh, discovered during the, the, uh, the, the, the analysis of the existing uh, Krakow were respected and how they behave in a new project and so on. And then we start this path. Every day, every time, new in something, uh, I mean, uh, experiencing something new and cr starting creating this, the structure of this methodology. A very important experience is the one of, uh, uh, this, this one in, um, in Norway, uh, in Trondheim, because once again, uh, for the first time, we start using flows and uh, environmental analysis. Uh, on a base on the, and at the urban scale, we still made a traditional urban morphology analysis, a morphological analysis. So based on the uh, kind of roads and topologies and the level of a nodality, but just analyzed on empirical base. And they told us that, for instance, within Trondheim, all the area of the, of the rear port right here, here on the right-hand side of the slide, it was an area of the, huge potential, but mm, not yet discovered, not yet mm, pushed out, not yet mm, developed. So we decided to concentrate our analysis. Oh, this is functional analysis. Uh, we decided to concentrate our analysis on this, on the, uh, uh, on the river port. We made, uh, we still, we, we were still using Ecotech as, soft, as software, not, not yet Envimet. Anyway, we analyze all this, uh, all this line very important because it's it need to be the new center of Trondheim. And also because the original center was a very mm, ground one inside the urban the the, the, the urban fabric, and uh, also because of the the, the very hard co weather condition in winter time, it wasn't very alive actually. Why the seaport also because of the huge tradition of the uh, ship tradition of uh, Trondheim. Uh, was much better because of the water for um, uh, for mitigating the, the weather because of the tradition and the identity of the place. So the municipality were asking uh, strongly to redevelop, regenerate the existing uh, river river port, but on a different base. So in order to create the new center of Trondheim, we made our environmental analysis on this site, and we start and we design actually our master plan. We used for the first time in this case the um, flows mapping because we were basically designing. Yes, uh, we are thinking at the river, but we were basically designing this strip of buildings. Most of them were existing warehouses, very interesting, and 
this public realm came very interesting, very important because it was a pedestrian and the vehicular system whose role was where uh, was to put together the, the new center, the new river port with existing uh, the fabric, but also to give an identity of this very long promenade. So on this base, uh, going there, we uh, analyze and we realize how people used to uh, leave these public spaces. And then on a, uh, so on a, on an environmental point, from an environmental point of view, we start focusing our attention on the different nodes that we did discover in our project, one, two, and three. For each of this, for each or any of them, we made a, uh, an, a first environmental analysis, and then of the base of criticalities we discover, we made a new environmental analysis after the project. So the, the role of the project was to mitigate the environmental condition and to answer to the morphological needs of the existing urban fabric. This is one of the, of the project. This is the second with the environmental analysis before the project and after the project. And of course, a very careful uh, and detailed uh, study of the material where we're going to use have been, uh, have been done because at that latitude, the, the weather is, the, the market climate is so, so strong that it's very important to work on the, uh, what we call the albedo, what is called the albedo value. So the value that had different kinds of materials, different kinds of color, or colors had to give back light and uh, temperature and grade. And this is the, the, the final master plan. Continuing this, our road, we make this competition that was for the, uh, the Zag de Rive de Lourdes in Paris. And that was quite interesting because once again, we are still working in balance between the traditional armor morphology and the environmental analysis. Actually, as you've seen in this first phase, the, 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 the work we've been doing much, the more than the, 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 we push much more the analysis and the work on the environmental elements than on the urban morphology. Because at the end of the day, at least in this phase, the urban morphology has got its own very strong tradition. So we can use it very easily anyway. We, start, we were starting working with flows, as you saw in Trondheim, but the very new thing was the uh, uh, environmental analysis and was the use of the environmental tools as uh, morphological and design tools. So that is why even here we made a, um, a traditional uh, morphological analysis of the area. This is very interesting area between the, the, the river and the, this is the river the, of Bondi going straight to Canal de Saint-Martin and then the, uh, the Seine and the, the center of, of Paris. This is the master plan. Uh, for instance, we keep alive this very huge market called uh, Kondo Conforama because it's a very important um, polarity from a functional point of view. Of course, we made a morphological analysis, the functional analysis, and so on. This is the morphological analysis of the context together with a new design, with a new project. I go faster because I think we're taking a little bit too much time. Uh, and then we made the environmental analysis of our morphological master plan in order to have the final result of the proper urban master plan. The analysis have been uh, is always the same, and what we will talk about later. But what is very important that is for the first time we go down the architectural scale in a very, um, very clear and very uh, in a clear, very clear clear way. So on the base of the environmental analysis, so on, on, on the, on the two-dimensional analysis and on the three-dimensional analysis, so we start not just the public spaces, but even how the facade used to be involved by the, the, the sun, the wind, and whatever, we choose different kind of materials of, um, for the facade and for the architecture. Moreover, these kind of materials have been also um, put together with the morphological awareness of the context. So it was not, it was not just a technician solution, you know, from, a, from an environmental point of view. No, we put together the environmental analysis and the morphological role of the new urban fabric in order to choose the right materials and to have the right 
uh, urban architecture. That is why we have uh, neighborhood units. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, gray stone or light stone, uh, depending if we are facing with the main boulevard and the main south boulevard, or uh, we are facing here the, the neighborhood building units. So we, have, we have been using um, wood and uh, concrete for the, for the waterfront and whatever. And this is why, and that was then had been very surprising, at the end of the project, we try to um, verify if our project based on, based on the morphological and environmental analysis from the urban to the architectural scale uh, used to address the needs of the uh, LEED certification for neighborhoods. Surprisingly, but not very much, not so, no, not so surprised actually, our project were, were addressing perfectly all the requirements made by lead certification for, uh, for, uh, for neighborhoods. It was very, very funny. We kept this, we kept lead, and we start very fine. Okay, um, let's think about patterns and design, quality, transit, uh, heat island reduction, green infrastructure, and blah, 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 and so on. All the the, the, the address, all the, 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 the needs of the lead certification were perfectly addressed by the project. That is why this project in Paris for us is very important because finally we realized that what we were working on, what we were, the methodology we were building, putting together urban morphology in a dynamic way and um, an environmental analysis, were in order to create an environmental urban design we're going in the right, in the right direction. Uh, no bad chance this project also won the, the prize for the best um, uh, research project uh, in uh, environmental urban design. Uh, it was the, uh, I can't remember the year, but I think it was the, nine, uh, the, tw the 2014, or no, sorry, the 2019, but I can't remember, anyway. Then this is the master plan. From Paris, I'm going to show you now two projects. We finally start using very clearly this methodology. The first experience is the one that's called Morphology and Sustainability in the Project of Public Spaces. It was a competition for the, pro for the project uh, for the design of the seven squares in the historical center of Viterbo. And uh, we kept this opportunity in order to develop for the first time in a very uh, clear away our methodology. So the first step was, of course, the, uh, the mapping of the urban flows. So we have been mapping all the different urban flows, at least in uh, very empirical ways using a smartphone app uh, on, right on the, in, a, in, a, in the public spaces. Uh, but we were dealing with seven public, public squares, the seven square of the historical center of Viterbo. So it was very, very easy to us to go into the the square uh, created different uh, what we call gates and uh, to the square gate to enter to enter and to go out of the square and make our our flows analysis. You see on the right hand side part, uh, part of this uh, analysis. You cannot read it, but anyway, they tell us what kind of flows, uh, what kind of range, uh, what direction, uh, we, so what quantity, what direction, and what speed. Then we made our environmental analysis based on the basic local climate data, a base of the albedo values, because when we're going to design a public space specifically, like, like in this way, the albedo values are absolutely important. We made solar axonometries, uh, we made, uh, of course, a thermal comfort analysis, a wind components analysis, and so on, in order to decide, you know, it is a public space. So we have to decide what is going to remain vehicular, what is going to be pedestrian. We have to, to decide what, in which side you have to, you have to walk, in which part you have to sit. We have to decide if to introduce, we are inside the historical center, typical Italian historical center. So we have to decide where and how put green elements within the public spaces and even water. Uh, Viterbo is a very famous city in the historical center, in the center of, uh, in the middle of Italy for its water. So it's very, it's a place rich for water. We wanted to enhance this uh, richness and then uh, in the, in its, uh, in its identity uh, and so on. We also have to have been dealing with uh, and talking with the uh, commercials because of course it is, it is a true project. So 
people um, having shops wanted to know if they can create their they hall outside, they can put tables, they can, it's a very complex project, a real project. We managed using environmental analysis and the morphological analysis. Um, a very important thing, I didn't say it before, but I say it now, uh, when we make an environmental analysis, uh, how can we use it? What we do usually is to in, um, single out the criticalities or the critical issues coming from the uh, environmental analysis, because this analysis tells us where it's too hot, to be very, very brief, where it's too hot, where it's too cold, where are we at that it's, it's too windy or not enough or not windy enough and so or too, too humid or whatever. So we create a panel of criticalities of so uh, situations uh, even ranged as well. So higher, lower, uh, medium and lower uh, um, uh, critical uh, critics issues uh, on the wind, on the, on the solar point of view, on the thermal point of view and so on. And then the project try to answer on one side on the, the way people use the public space. And it is great that is thanks to the mapping of the, uh, of the pedestrian flows. On the other side, what kind of uh, critical situations are within public space? Putting this together, it is uh, incredibly how people behave following functions, of course, because if I'm going to shop or to, for shopping, I go straight to my shops, but even on weather. So when the, there are the critical, the, the critical issues from an environmental point of view, probably people are not going there anymore. That, is, that means that, for instance, shops that face this uh, heat island areas, for instance, are, you know, lose their money because they receive, they, they get less uh, less people than, than in other parts, parts of the squares. So all these elements together guided us for the urban design of these squares. This is the oral design, choice of uh, kind of greens, kind of trees or greeneries and water and materials of all. And these are some, uh, I'll go very quick, some of the project, Piazza Fontana Grande. You see on the right hand, uh, the right -hand side, uh, through GIS, the different kind of environmental analysis. We basically use um, four thresholds. Uh, the, the, are the, the correspond to the two equinox and the two solstice in order to have these four points uh, good enough to control the overall um, microclimatic uh, trend over the year. Uh, Piazza de Gesù, Piazza San Square, Piazza San Lorenzo, and whatever, and so on. Piazza del Plebiscito. And let's go to the last uh, the uh, example to the last project. Uh, Venice, uh, this project, the title, the title of this project, it is a, a research project, is a regenerative design processes in urban morphology, the Venice case study. Mm. First of all, let's say some few words about the, uh, the, the, the urban fabric of Venice. Uh, the Venetian urban fabric have been structured, let's say, ac according to three main types of fabric. The so-called quadrangular square, the Venetian called the call it campo, that belongs to the archipelago city. So the first city, the city of the 10th to 11th century, with a clear predominance of waterway or waterways over land routes. On the right hand side, you, you can see the, the empty space of the campo, so of the quadrangular square. The type two is the uh, let's say, calm shade plan. It is, they see the balance of values between water and land routes. It is typical of the Gothic, well, uh, of the Gothic uh, Venice, and it start developing after the 12th century. So uh, the 12th and the 13th century on the previous existing <clears throat> uh, archipelago city. The type three, it is the fundamenta type. As typical, all the areas uh, is a, it is it is characterized by predominance of land routes over waterways, and it is typical of the Renaissance and modern Venice, so between the 16th to the 18th century. And but it is um, it has been used, let's say, this type of uh, urban tool in all these uh, on the fringe belt of the islands of, uh, of Venice where they needed to create new, let's say, new, new border, new fringe for, from the city and the lagoon, uh, lagoon area. On the base of these three types, we've been 
selecting three of this uh, correctly three typical uh, three, three typical types of urban fabric within the urban the urban fabric of Venice. San Polo, Campo San Polo, Campo Santa Maria Formosa, e Canareggio. Campo San Polo is it belong to the quadrangular, is a typical quadrangular campo belonging to the archipelago city. Santa Maria Formosa, uh, it is it represents a spine structure, so it, it is uh, typical of the uh, Gothic Venice in balance between water, land, water and land systems. And Canareggio, it is the classic. Uh, example of uh, fundamenta and with this uh, sort of a comb structure uh, oriented just in one direction and so on, typical of the Renaissance and modern Venice. So the empty space, the spine, uh, the empty type, uh, the spine type, and the comb type. Let's start from the first and let's start reading San Polo. Uh, San Polo is this, it is one of the parish of uh, uh, crossing, let's say, Canal Grande, Canal Grande, north to south. The system was made of this one, two, three, four parish churches are across to this long um, canal. And what is interesting to see is that this long canal changed name four times because one, two, three, four, every time it reached the area of the influence area of one church, it changed, it takes, they change the name. So it's a uh, uh, Campo is the river, it is called, the canal is called Canale San Polo here because we had the parish church of San Polo here, but here in the, his name is San Zan de Gola because of the, uh, of the church and the, the parish of San Zan de Gola and so on. All of this represented the, 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 the units of the archipelago city of the first Venice after the Roman colonization. And they are very interesting because any of them represented a community, a community living on the, on, on the canals. But then when the, 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 the form of the, 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 of the city had been finally, you know, um, settled up in some, somehow settled up, then they, they start to be recognized, they start to recognize themselves all of these communities around the square, so around the, and around the parish churches. So this is a, we can, we can call about, we can talk about the uh, neighborhood community, one second community, third community, and some polo community. And we also, this, what you see here is the Barbary uh, plan from the 1551. And it is interesting to notice how the Sao Paulo Island is, it, it, it was already paved uh, in the, uh, the half of the 16th century, telling us how the community of Sao Paulo was already aware of, the, of itself and really properly structured within the urban fabric. While, for instance, San Zan de Gola was still a field, an open field, not by chance that the name of the Venetian give to their own squares is Campo, that in Italy means fields. Because remember that the formation of the um, modern Venice started from the, uh, the, always from the river and then reached the, the squares. But just later on, when we are, we will arrive to the second phase, the one of the spine system, all this square um, um, transformed the same, becoming real piazzas, a real square within the urban center. What we did, of course, is was uh, first of all a flows analysis of the of this axis, and even of the axis connecting San Paolo with Ponte di Rialto. On this base, we made our morphological map always completely based on the flows uh, uh, analysis. Asli <laughs> Konku, uh, we can hear you. Okay. And, uh, oops, sorry. On this base, we, we, we can create our dynamic morphological map and actually have been uh, we've been comparing this um, dynamic morphological map with a traditional one. You can see a piece of this on the right hand side, but even with the space syntax approach, um, uh, there was a very interesting work made by Tsara. And surprisingly, but not very much, the flows analysis was much more accurate than these two the, the traditional one and the space syntax one. Then, of course, we made the data maps, the functional one the pattern strips uh, ones and so on, and the environmental analysis. You don't understand it, but many, it tells us many, many things. We've actually made it in two, in, sorry, in four threshold over the year, but even in two years, we made it in 2020 
and in 2050. It tells us many important things about the use of public spaces. We are not going long on this, but we use all this information in order to design and to think the new squares. Then the spine type in Santa Maria Formosa, you see, we still have the canals, very important, but the most important system is made by this pedestrian walk and the spine form within the islands. We made our flows analysis in this part of the other fabric. We made the data map on the functions and pertinent strips. And of course, what we saw from the functions, as for instance, is that the more specialistic functions are concentrated on what we call the highest nodality level uh, road, on what, what we used to call the matrix road. And as soon as we go far from this higher uh, nodality level, uh, as soon as we go to lower level of nodality, as soon as the specialization of the urban fabric go down until to reach just residential urban fabrics. This is the environmental analysis. And the last, the Canareggio, the, the, the com shape type, with the flows analysis, the specialistic or data maps, and the environmental analysis. Uh, we had lots of information from this kind of analysis. Uh, actually, this paper has been presented in some other international uh, situations, an international conference, and is going to be published on a, it is actually in publication of, on, a, on, a, on a volume made by Cambridge scholars. But on this base, so on the, on the, uh, on, on the base of, the, uh, on the, of this morphological and environmental analysis of the urban fabric of Venice, we're not just limited to propose a redesign to of the different squares of these three uh, pieces of the urban fabric. But basically, we use the, all these analysis in order to create a toolkit, a design toolkit for the project of a new different area in, uh, in Venice. We choose an area in the Judecca Island that is uh, on, the, on the fringe belt south of, uh, of Venice. It is an empty place where Venice, the, the Venice municipality is going to do, uh, to do something. And we decide, first of all, to keep all these elements, morphological and environmental, as a base, as a toolkit for the morphological um, master plan. We start drawing the master plan on the base of the information we get from the morphological and environmental analysis. Uh, we do it quite in a very accurate way. So the, the, uh, huge differences of typologies, uh, a strong functional mixity, an organization in uh, neighborhood units and a very uh, aware environmental uh, design, different materials for uh, the, the normal road that, they, that we call Calle, uh, different material for the courtyard, uh, different materials for the uh, neighborhood building, neighborhood units, but even a, con a, a huge control of the wind that in this part of the of Venice, it's very important to mitigate above all in summertime, the humidity and the very hot weather. Uh, for instance, using systems of courtyard along this very, very long uh, uh, streets. Uh, any house has got two courtyards, one to the north, one to the south, uh, one with trees and the other one without, uh, in order to create a, a microclimatic balance within the, uh, the, the single house and within the urban uh, neighborhoods, but also uh, having different kind of windows in order to, to, to give favor to the transversal ventilation because we made a, the wind analysis uh, and we discovered that the, we had two different um, main direction in winter and in summertime. So we tried to evaluate, of course, the um, the, the, the fresh ventilation coming in in summertime and to control the um, cold wind, the cold winds coming in uh, winter time and also using different colors for the uh, for the windows in order to enhance the uh, albedo values uh, above all for all those parts that are facing to the north and so on. This is another view, it commercial on the fundamenta, different kind of culture, the special buildings on the waterfront. This is the waterfront. But at the end of the day, we decided to do something more because we said, okay, we made this morphological environmental analysis of Venice. And actually it is very new. It is the first time that some have been made. It, is, it has been made for the first time. And on the base of this analysis, we create 
and new neighborhoods in the south of Venice. But let's start thinking, let's imagine that all this stuff is a sort of uh, pre-existing to the new transformation of the city. Let's imagine that all these elements at the end of the day belong directly to the um, morphological and um, climatic history of Venice. So to the, um, let's say Venetian uh, building process and morphological process, we use them as a latent structure for a new, very pushed, very, very smart, very new, very innovative urban design for the, the city of the future. This is for the future, for the city of today, but I think about the features of the, of the future that is sustainable, pedestrian, of course, but Venice is pedestrian, smart and whatever. And so we start using a group of designers that was far from our research and from our analysis, but we work together, of course, trying to develop a new layer for the future city of Venice, of this part of the of Venice, this is the island of the, this is the Judaic island. We made some study, some sketch, and this was one of the results. It was very interesting to us because uh, on one side we maintain this very long system that, is, that belongs to the Byzantine colonization and the Roman colonization of the, of the lagoon, of Venetian lagoon, made of this uh, strigue, so very, very long plots going, going from, from the water to the, from, sorry, from the lagoon to the, in, to the uh, inland, but we're using also the courtyard house type, because at the beginning, since the, when the, the, uh, at the time of the Roman colonization of, of the Venetian lagoon, the courtyard type was the basic Typology, uh, res residence of typology of that time. It remained at the, in somehow in the very, very um, inside to the developing of the modern and contemporary urban fabric. So we decided to maintain this basic urban alignment and then to use the title of the courtyard house typologies because also it's the best typology for uh, so the developing and the design of a sustainable and smart uh, urban living and urban fabric because it is based on a different, very strong hierarchy of public spaces, collective spaces, private spaces. Uh, uh, it allows the mixture of functions. Uh, it has a good, very good density, but working basically on a B dimensional level instead of going up to the very, very tall buildings. So we couldn't afford in, uh, it could be afforded in the uh, Venetian urban fabric. Uh, you see, so this is the result. Uh, these are some render from the inside. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I try to be not too long. I uh, want uh, uh, Professor Kamitz told me to be within the one hour and uh, I think more or less I respect the, the time. Uh, what to say left, many, many things to say not enough time to, to, to say all these kind of things, but I hope you get the main topics, the main concepts of, sorry, and the base of this uh, uh, methodology, because it is going to open, I believe, not just our methodology, but it is go opening a new way of approaching to uh, urban design, it's an environmental urban design. Thank you again. Much. Marco Maretto. Uh, actually, this lecture shows that urban morphology is not only a discipline for people who are interested in studying the, the, the built environment, but moreover, it is essential for those people who are designing the and planning and designing the uh, built environment of our cities. And I do believe that the application of the you know these analysis methods to the design process is capable of providing results that no other uh, approach can uh, provide. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we would like to welcome, this is unscheduled, but surprise, we would like to welcome Fabiana Racco from the University of Ferrara, uh, who will present the summer school after the damages, which we have already sent as an invitation to most of our graduation students. I'm going to post the link in the chat for those who um, don't have that information. So the Fabiana Racco is uh, assistant professor at the Department of Architecture of the University of Ferrara, and her research area is ECAR 17, which stands for um, representation and, and uh, survey. Uh, so Fabiana Racco, the floor is yours. Please uh, 
feel free to uh, explain what it is all about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you uh, all for this uh, opportunity to introduce, uh, I will be very short, uh, our, um, our project, our educational project. I don't, does it, okay, maybe I didn't share the screen. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, uh, the probably it doesn't work the full presentation. Okay, do you see it? Does it work? Yes, okay. It's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Um, I'm here today as uh, one of the uh, co-scientific responsible of the uh, summer school, which is a part of uh, an academy, an international academy, um, about uh, the strategies, tools, uh, um, experiences and uh, know-how uh, of um, reconstruction after um, damages, I, I mean uh, fire, earthquakes, uh, flood, floods and so on. Um, just to let you know the dimension of the, 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 are the main topics, so the, the academy uh, is uh, organized all over the year uh, and it uh, involves uh, several uh, focuses uh, uh, along the year about uh, uh, topics uh, for um, in, in April we um, uh, we had uh, a special a special issue um, managed by ecomos and so um, during the second part and the same during the second part of this this year but the main part of the academy is the uh, summer school which will take place this year from uh, uh, in july the first two weeks of july and it's uh, open to graduated uh, from a variety of disciplines, architects, uh, engineers, but also uh, graduated in uh, humanities or in economical sciences and so on, who are uh, everyone who is interested in this type of uh, themes, uh, such as risk reduction, post-disaster participatory governance tools, governance strategies, and so on. From the point of view of architectural scale, but also you mentioned um, the uh, city or the orb urban scale or landscape scale. Um, the um, summer school is um, part of a, um, a huge um, partnership, which is uh, uh, here you can see the faculty members. Uh, and uh, about that, we are pleased if, you, if uh, everyone wants to join this part of um, of network. And uh, um, the head of the summer school, our free professor uh, at the University of Ferrara, seems to be uh, this type of activity is financed under the Emilia Romagna region. And our scientific uh, committee, um, international scientific committee, involves uh, several experts uh, um, who belong to a variety of uh, um, institutes, uh, but also public administrations and so on all over the world. Um, the process of this uh, here, this is uh, the um, the fund and the program who, uh, under which the academy is financed and is um, a part also of a, um, of a network which uh, involves some international partners um, interested in this type of uh, fields of research, uh, such as uh, institutions, uh, public institutions uh, who are involved in the Fire Steel project, which is a cooperation, a transnational cooperation project, Italia Croatia, which is uh, still running in this uh, in this period, and also uh, a lot of uh, uh, partners or stakeholders such as. 
public-private partnership, uh, um, like uh, the Cluster Build Association, which is a public-private association in the field of architecture, and uh, the Green Building Council, also the ECOMOS, and uh, so on. Uh, here you can see um, the um, um, where the partner come come from, and um, here the main activities we uh, which we promote during the year. So I mentioned the two weeks of a cat of the summer school, which are two weeks of intensive. Uh, lessons uh, and also uh, workshop activity, uh, which involves uh, which involve uh, also or, and involved in the previous two editions, uh, also public uh, administ uh, administrators or, uh, for instance, managers of um, museums or archaeological sites. Uh, as well as uh, professionals from a variety of disciplines in order to exchange experiences and in order to uh, provide an, an update uh, state of the art uh, um, with reference to this, uh, this main focus, which is uh, uh, the built heritage, the risk affected by the built heritage, uh, natural, but not only natural uh, risks with women. Um, during the first uh, year, uh, we had uh, also a lot of uh, uh, lecturers from uh, a variety of countries. The main uh, aim is uh, to exchange different points of view uh, about uh, the, the risks and how to manage it, how to measure it, how to uh, involve also particip through participants participatory uh, process, uh, all the stakeholders, the inhabitants, and so on. And uh, um, at the same time, the participants uh, um, came from uh, all these uh, countries that you, you can see uh, here in this map. Uh, from the first edition to the second edition, we have almost uh, more than 60 participants. The participation is uh, free because, um, uh, thanks to the support of the Emilia Romagna region, we decided uh, uh, this type of activity uh, of activity uh, started uh, unfortunately, unfortunately during the pandemic period, but was an occasion to implement the uh, online the. Um, the use of the online and uh, e-learning uh, uh, tools. So we decided also for uh, the third edition this year to uh, maintain the same format. So the lessons will be available uh, through a Zoom uh, platform uh, that uh, um, can um, allow us uh, to translate all the lessons that will be in English but sometimes also in the Portuguese or uh, Chinese or um, Spanish and so on. So we uh, all the lessons will be translated in, from the native lang language to English uh, for uh, the entire period. And so, um, and at the same time, this uh, this platform, this method, uh, give us gives us the opportunity to reach. Uh, different countries uh, uh, instead of a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, solution, which is uh, uh, already um, um, functional, but uh, definitely um, less uh, um, effective in order to have a, a huge uh, exchange of experiences. Mm, the previous results uh, of the, the first and the second edition are available uh, at this website. Uh, every year we uh, publish the, um, uh, a sort of uh, results, articles, uh, summaries, uh, and so on. And uh, at the same time, we are managing uh, most important publications that you can uh, see more in detail also the results of the um, students' uh, works because one of the main activities 
is to involve uh, participants in groups and to um, under the supervision of a professor uh, or um, a partner um, which is a uh, part of the which is a uh, who joined the summer school, uh, each uh, group developed a presentation, um, a study, a short study, definitely, but very um, useful to uh, verify diff the different points of views. And uh, all these type of materials are also available at this website. Um, some um, focuses about uh, the, um, the previous activities. You can see uh, uh, all, all of them in detail at uh, our website. And uh, please feel uh, um, feel free to contact us also to have uh, uh, more information. Our idea idea is also to um, support. Uh, the organization of this uh, such uh, um, events uh, at uh, um, our partner seats at our partner institutions and so we are um, would be very pleased if you want to exchange with us some ideas or suggestions or if you want to join um, the network in order also to, to develop projects or uh, everything else uh, about this topic. Uh, this, uh, this year, the summer school will be uh, in from the 5th to the 19th of July. Uh, uh, each day at, at the afternoon time from uh, 2 p.m. to uh, 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. It depends on the, on the day. And um, the um, call for applica applicants is still open. The deadline is the 3rd of June 2022. And um, after that, it will um, start the phase of uh, selection. And in order to have at the end of June, um, before uh, the end of June, the, the list of participants. Uh, also this year, the summer school is open uh, here uh, up to 60 participants as well as in the previous uh, first and second edition. Um, and here you can see more details. Um, that, that's it. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for, for this uh, this occasion, and I remain at your disposal if you have some. Uh, Thank you. Questions. Fabiana, just one recommendation. Can you explain very briefly to the students that would like to join what they should do and when is the deadline for that? Yes, of course. Uh, is there an application form? I see our manager has already. Um, send uh, the, this type of information and basically uh, within the 3rd of June uh, each uh, candidate uh, candidate has to um, send a CV in English and a motivational letter that's quite uh, in, in um, briefly the, the, the duty in order to apply Thank you very much. So the link is provided in the chat. If anyone of you is interested in joining, you should be able to find there in all the information. If not, send me an email and I'm, I'm going to forward you oh, the, the call. So all the students who have any kind of interest in this, uh, send me an email or just go to the link with, of the summer school, which I have provided in the chat. So. To conclude, thank you very much, uh, Fabiana Araco. And just for you to know, I'm going to be in Ferrara 5, 6, and 7 uh, of, of June. So, you know, we're going to get together there. Marco, thank you so much for joining. Um, and I'm going to be in Bologna, 